got Eligio, he's right here. This is Bryant, this is Cameron, and that is Ashley, okay? Each, each one of these victims has their own individual experience and their own individual tale of what occurred uh, during that concert. And uh, this is a true eyewitness account of what they suffer and what they had to go through um, in the context of uh, personal injuries, in the context of seeing people die and people pass out in front of them, uh, seeing children being trampled to the point where uh, Cameron had fallen uh, almost into a ditch, had to be pulled out by someone that was essentially with her, has not slept for three days. Um, and this, there are so many stories that you're going to hear, so you, maybe you'll get a, a really of a clean view exactly what these children went to uh, when they attended this concert. And what we provided is maybe some photos of initially when they went to attend this concert, that they went there with their friends, they went there to have a good time, and they went there to have some fun, and it turned probably into the biggest nightmare that they could ever experience in one that's not going to go away anytime soon. So uh, I want to start you off with Jonathan, because Jonathan had his own experience. And, and Jonathan, just briefly, if you just let him know uh, your experience in regards to the concert. Uh, when you got there, uh, you were happy to be there. And once you got in there, tell him about the experience that you had and how things got progressively worse and where you landed and how you were able to basically leave uh, while chaos is ongoing. Can we before get Jonathan to come starts, to the microphone? Can they give Absolutely. Can they give their name, please, and spell it in their age before each class starts? You got it. Jonathan, won't you come in here, take my seat, okay. and I'll trade seats with you, okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to sit down right there. You introduce yourself. You give them your name and you give them your age. And then you give them a, a narrative of what happened. <clears throat> My name is Jonathan Espinosa, J-O-N-A-T-H-O-N, Espinosa, E-S-P-I-N-O-Z-A. I'm 18 years old, and I was at the Travis Scott concert. Uh, we got there, and like any other um, festival, we were super excited to be there. Um, I went with my girlfriend, my brother, and my dad, um, and I was having a good time. Uh, we got there, and already there was a bunch of people. Um, we go through the COVID screening, and then we make our way towards the gates where they check our bracelets to get into the festival. And while we're walking to the festival gates itself, people are already um, breaking down the gates to get to, just to break the gates and to just cut the line. Um, instantly right there, my heart was dropped. Um, part of the, that was probably one of the scariest things that I've ever been through. Um, gates had fallen. Police were everywhere, and uh, it was just chaos already in the making. Uh, we get through the metal detectors, and they asked to clear our pockets. We clear our pockets, and you have two guards just kind of talking. The wand didn't go off. Uh, was wearing a belt. The belt didn't even go off. Um, that instantly rang a bell in my head too. And what what could happen? What what could somebody have? And what could somebody have brought into the concert itself if my belt didn't go off? Um, we get into the concert, we take pictures, uh, everything seems okay. We kind of put everything that had happened on the outside of the gates to themselves. Uh, we try to have a good time then, we take pictures, we go walk around, and we start making our way to the stage. Um, made our way to the stage, instantly we get towards the railing. Um, the concert start, it seems to be everything going okay. Um, and we hope that there's a good time, you know, down the road, and obviously there, there wasn't. Um, one of the acts performed, and about, no joke, about 200 plus people come into this, this little compact area that we were in, and instantly we tell security, like, it's getting tight in here, it's getting squished. Security themselves tells us, you just put your hands on the railing and push back with your force and whatever force you have. Um, we've tried, I tried pushing back as hard as I can, and as a small guy like me, it didn't go, it didn't go too well. Um, my body instantly gets shifted, and so therefore my hips, or my ribs, gets towards the metal, um, gate that are bolted into the ground. So even if you were the strongest guy, you weren't moving the, the, the railing. 
uh, like I said, about 200 plus people come, and instantly my ribs are getting collapsed into into the gate. And I look at the guard, and he looks at me, and he's like, well, I can't do nothing. And so I'm getting squished, and instantly I'm looking at, at Ashley and Brian, and I'm like, are y'all okay? So I can't even enjoy the concert. And, you know, we go there, we pay, we pay a lot of money to see the actors that we like. And instantly it's more of a fear. You gotta worry about who's getting smushed. Is your family getting smushed? Are you gonna get smushed? Can you even breathe? Instantly the air gets too tight. Um, and there's a little girl, um, probably three people next to me. And she's like, I wanna get out. And I, it was, it was the most shocking thing I've ever seen. Eyes were just wide open. She looked scared for her life. And instantly, um, just, I guess I guess it's who I am. I'm like, yo, like y'all y'all need to open up so you can get out. And I tell the security guard, that's not even my job. The security's supposed to be helping him out. We're supposed to be trusting these people to get us out, to be there for us. We we pay these people to be there for us, to help us, to protect us, and we're the ones protecting each other. And so the girl's asking for help and it's so tight that nobody can move. Like your hips feel like they have weight on them. Your your chest is already compact. And so I have to pick her up by the armpit and kind of give it to, I have to give it to security after calling him, after he's watching the show, and he should be looking at us and te like helping us. And he finally grabs her and he tries to pull her, but it's so tight that her hips are like locked in. And so me and another gentleman have to help her by the feet and throw her over. And so that was one shocking event. And we're already looking at each other like, like what are we gonna do? Is the night gonna be like this? And then once again, you're like, okay, we're at a festival. There's just one person, like, okay, stuff happens. The night continues, more people come, um, and it's just it's so crowded. And then we go to the, the actual main event, Travis Scott, and it's us three, and it's my brother leading the way. He's the smallest, so we're trying to get, you know, as close as we can because you go to a concert, you want to have fun. You don't want to be in fear of, oh, my gosh, what can happen? Instantly, people are like, it, it, it's just ruthless. People are too tight. They only want, they want to keep their spot. So we get lost. My brother makes his way to the front. We kind of get scattered in the middle. And we instantly already like, like this is too many people. We're like glued onto each other in, in such a way. And and the night, the night rolled like that. Um, there, I remember there was a there's a medic cart trying to make its way, and nobody like as a human instinct you expect people are in danger. Let me help them out. Let me move for these people. You can't even do that when the artist is there chanting like, "Are y'all okay?" I like cool, and then he continues with his act. Whenever you you you're looking at a medical cart and a guy laying down, probably purple, he like who sees it on a regular basis like. It still replays in my head. I, before I go to bed, I, that's the first thing I think about. Is if that was, if that was my brother, because we, like I said, we got separated. The only thing in my mind was, well, where is he at? Did he get hurt? Is he gonna make it to the end of the concert? Um, I couldn't even breathe. He's smaller than me. Is he on the ground? And then you see people on the ground, and the first thing you think is, what if that was me? How can I help? And so. As the night goes on, the, the air gets real thin. And if you're not tall, you're not big, and your head's not up, you, you can't breathe. Um, the concert ends and we had a meeting spot like of where to meet after the concert. And so that took a while to even get to, because like I said, it was so tight. It probably took me about 20 minutes just to find my, to find my dad. Um, and that, that was scary itself. But in the process of walking to the meeting spot, a, medic, a medical guy actually Pushed, pushed Ashley out of the way, and then he's like, y'all need to move. And all you see driving by is a guy laying down and just doing CPR. And it looked like, no, it looked like nobody knew what to do. And like I said, security, I, we, we were looking at another performance and security, I told him, I said, my brother wants to get out, like he can't breathe. Like he needs, he needs to get out. And he said, sorry, people have been telling me that all day. We're not gonna let nobody want people out. Who does that? If somebody's not breathing, wouldn't your first instinct be to get them out? But that goes to tell you who, who, who belonged there, the training they had, that goes to tell what we spent our hard working money for and to, for an event like this. It was, it was ridiculous.
we we went out for for a good time and obviously left with disappointment with grief. I mean, it's sad to say who who the victims who who were injured, and it's even more sad to say the victims that were were killed. Um, you don't you don't go anywhere thinking, oh my gosh, something bad's gonna happen. Especially for the money that we're paying, you would expect top notch security, medics, not medics who don't even know what CPR is. Go to say they had one AED out of the whole festival for five for fifty thousand people. This is this is just ridiculous for what the money that we pay for and the hard work and time that we put in. I mean, well, I'm a college student. I I work my I work really hard to to get my ticket and. Although it was canceled, it wasn't even about that. It was about what happened during that 12 hours that he had performing and the other artists, and it was it was awful. Did you sustain physical injuries? I did. Um, I am absolutely in pain. I've never been in pain like that ever. Um, like I said, when I was pushing against the barricade, my whole lower body hurts. Uh, my calves feel really tight from where I was just holding on, like. For like my life, I guess you could say. Um, my arms are sore from where I was leaning on the rail like that, and I would look in the sky, and it was just like a big old breath, like when my chest was expanding, and then I would have to obviously put myself back down, and it just got super hot. Um, my ribs on the inside hurt bad, um, and even my lower back, just from where elbows and pushing, and and where the rail was going into my side. So this is like I said, this is pain that I've never felt. I never thought I'd wake up in the morning and be out of breath because every time I go to bed I re I relive the concert in my dream and it's just like it's shocking. I, I call her in the morning and I'm like, look I'm 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 scared and I, I don't feel like anyone should go through that. You mentioned you have any cost of the ticket. How much is the concert? One moment one how moment. How much is the ticket? You, you talked about the price. The so the the ticket, um you wait in a queue. And so you're lucky if you get a ticket for about 250 bucks. Resale was shooting up to 400, even 800 bucks. And when he released more tickets, probably a month before the concert, they were right about 600 dollars. So, so did you go the first two years this concert? We went for the year before this, the two years before this, because it was canceled last year right. due to COVID. And why do you think it was such a disaster this year as opposed to the first two years when no one died? Exactly. What was the main difference? They told them, you know, what it was a disaster the first year. Tell them why they were both the same. The first year was was pretty hectic as well. Um, you would think that a, an artist like that who gets paid millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, would want to succeed in something like that that has his name on it, um, especially because he's so big to the youth. Um, it was just it was. Executed poorly. Um, like I said, you you pay a pretty penny for for giving your your life into these guys' hands. Um, the park, the facility, the security. I mean, a water for crying out loud was five bucks. You would think like I'm paying a pretty penny. Uh, we're gonna have a good time. We're we we're gonna take pictures that are like look like we're gonna see our favorite artist. He comes around once a year. People pay a lot of money to go see him. Jonathan, tell me about. The 2019 show, how they also stormed the gates and knocked down. So the, the 2019 gates show, they did storm the gates as well, and there's footage of it, and it's advertised as, as um, as rager, so to say. And you would think, do I want that in the following year, or would you look at that and examine it as a higher up and look, do are we gonna barricade that fence, or are we gonna do stuff differently this year? 2019. I don't, I don't know the exact number of people that went, um, but the gates were down, there was stampede, there was chaos everywhere. How does that lead to 2021? 20, whenever you're trying trying to make stuff better each year, I mean, security, like I said, by itself, you would think there'd be security top notch. Okay, 2019 went okay, let's make 2021 like a year, remember, he had a, he had a whole year to, to plan it out. Yeah, two years to plan it out. How do you not? How do you not fix what's wrong? Jonathan, let uh, let let Brian go ahead and introduce himself. Yes, sir. Take your, take your chair. In your hometown, too, please. Okay. Why don't you give him your hometown? Where you uh, I'm from Corpus Christi. My name is Brian Espinosa. I'm 16. B R Y A N E S P I N O Z A. I went to the concert or the festival 
expecting a good time, went to go see one of my favorite artists, Travis, I, one of his biggest fans this time. He really disappointed me in what what he had and what he did. He could have stopped the show. He could have prevented all this if he really wanted to, but it seemed like he didn't. And the security there, you I only saw not even a handful of security, medics, or nothing. I felt like my life was on the line at one point. It was on the line. Everyone's life was on the line. At one point, my ribs were getting into the railing, basically impelled, and I was fearing for my life that I wasn't going to make it. And luckily, I jumped that gate, and a security guard helped me, which there was like hundreds of bodies on the floor already from people passing out, falling over the railing. Just I just saw people fighting for their life, fear in their eye, screaming. It was scary. Literally at night, I can't even sleep. I stay up most of the night because of this. I just rethink it and just see the people's faces that are purple, fearing for their life. It's just so much. Like you go to festival having a good time, not expecting eight people to die or more or people injured. You don't, you don't see that that much at festivals. Three hundred people injured. They barely seemed like they had security. The security didn't know what they were doing. Paramedics didn't know what they were doing. They didn't even know how to do CPR. And the security, when performances were going on, they were literally dancing to the music. They weren't even like seeing if people were okay. And if that, they were barely helping any people out. Like my brother said, at one, one of the performances, I was uh, trying to get out, and they told me, no, you got to go out the whole back way, which there is 50,000 people literally waiting to see people and push forward. There's no way I was going to get out of that back. So I literally had to wait and fear, fearing that I was going to end up dying if I couldn't breathe. So he told me, stay in there, you can't get out because people have been saying that all day, which makes no sense because you're a security guard. You're getting paid for this job. It's not like you're doing it for free. So, like, me almost dying, I guess he couldn't help me or something. It was it was a mess. And then once the main show started, I ended up going to the Travis thing. Uh, there was a railing. There was a girl behind me and a railing. So once he first started, the, the girl behind me was getting smushed. And then she left, and that's when I was against that railing and getting and basically impelled into that railing. My ribs were literally bruised and hurt. And it's just, it was just a mess because I felt like I was about to die when I was trying to see one of my favorite artists perform. And it's just a disappointment of what happened and that people literally have to die at this festival, which it didn't have to go to that point. He should have learned from 2019. He saw everything that happened. I'm more sure from 2019, if you read, there was more people that got injured. So he could have learned and prevented all this from happening. Literally, they stormed the gate right when we first got there. And in 2019, they did that too. So I don't know why he didn't learn on, yeah, let me um, like do more to fix these problems that happened two years ago. And then this year happened much more worse. People died, more chaos, everything happened. Can you walk us through quickly when you asked the jury for help and they denied you help? Uh, so uh, it was during the scissor, the scissor performance. I just wanted to get out because it was so hot at that point. I was there for mm, eight hours probably just watching all my artists against that railing. So I felt like I just need to get out right now because I had enough. I'm tired. It's hot. There's a lot of people on you. It feels like a lot of weight on your feet because you've been standing literally eight hours all day. So I wanted to get out. I told him, I said, or my brother told him, he said, Hey, can you please come get my brother out? It's hot. He feels like he's going to pass out, which I did. And one of the security guards said, no, people have been saying that all day. You can't. So I guess he just left me there. The security was on the other side of the barricade. Yes, ma'am. He refused to help get you out of the barricade. Yes, ma'am. Face to face. Mm -hmm. We're literally right in front of him asking to get me out. And he said no because people have been doing that all day. If people were doing that all day, you should feel like, Yes, let me help you because it's just it was just a mess. Ashley, won't you come up and just take the podium for a second? Can come we get Yes, please, please, please. Thank you, buddy. As you saw, uh, Cameron exit. Uh, Cameron has not slept in about 
the last four days. I mean, she is completely distraught, and she, uh, you know, did her best to come here, but she may not be willing to or able to to go ahead and speak to y'all this evening. Go ahead, Ashley, please. Please tell your first and last name. My name is Ashley Chapa, A S H L E Y C H A P A. How old are you? Uh, 18 or 19 years old. Sorry. Where are you from? Uh, Corpus Christi, Texas. Were you with the whole group together? No, I was with. Um, I had arrived with Brian and Jonathan and their dad. Um, during the first performances, I was with Jonathan and Brian, and we were around the same area, and that's where we were um, pushed up against the barricade most of the time. And similar to their experiences, the security guards had told us about putting our arms on the railing and just pushing as hard as we can. Obviously, we're not very big, tall kids or even strong people, so no matter what, um, there's so much weight being pushed against you and you're just constantly like being pressed up against it. And Jonathan and Brian tried the best that they could to try to like block that from getting to me and to help me not get as squished as they, they could. What did you see regarding the person on the ground that was turning purple? So that was during the Travis Scott performance. A uh, medical cart started driving by, and the security guard shoved me out of the way to try to get the cart by. And as they were doing that, I just I turned. I was confused. I was like, "Why did he shove me?" And I turn and I look, and he's on top of a person, just giving them chest compressions. And you never saw them check their pulse or do anything. They just jumped on top, and they're on his chest and. His face was just purple, and you couldn't really tell if they were alive or not, or not at that point. Let me ask you, there's some reports out today about possible fentanyl overdoses, a bad crash of pills and drugs going around. Did y'all see any of that? There was a lot of drugs. Tell um, me about that. At one point, we were leaving the smaller stage where all the small artists were playing, or the other ones, and we are walking to Travis Scott, and we passed by this man with a... Um, I guess it's like a Snapchat screen, and they wrote the text on there, and it said, um, what was it? Oh, it said LSD for $15. Oh and um, obviously little kids or just young people that are there are going to see that. They're going to be like, oh, I've never tried this before. Let's try it, whatever. Um, so that may, might have played a factor into everything just because of how, um, how it was available, like how easily... A kid could have walked up to him, cash at him, or given him cash right there, and he could have gotten it. So just so I get it right, can you explain that again? You said a guy was walking around with, on his the, cell phone and it said LSD for sale? Yeah, it said LSD for $15, $15. in big dollars. letters. He had like a, I guess like a lighting up shirt on, so he was just walking around holding it like that. So is it your impression then that some people were completely drugged? I believe that a lot of them were, obviously Drugs were everywhere in that concert, such as like everyone was smoking weed. But what, what's that rampant from drug use? Are people just looking the other way? Is it just like a drug party? Do whatever the heck you want? No, I don't think so. How is it allowed? I think just like with the lack of security um, and the lack of like bag checking. Like I, one of them had stated like we literally just threw our bag on there. And they went like that, and they walked straight through. So they didn't search for anything. They weren't looking for anything. They simply had security as, I guess, the least amount that they could. And all the people sneaking in, you don't know what they brought or anything mm -hmm. like that. Do you feel like there was a lack of security? Yes. I, I believe there was maybe like 10 around us during the small stage, and I didn't see any during Travis Scott's set, other than the ones that I did see on top of kids. Let me, let me get him so he can come in and kind of introduce himself to y'all as well. <clears throat> I'm Alihio Garcia. I'm 18. It's E L I G I O and then Garcia G A R C I A. You also uh, from Corpus? Yes, I'm also from Corpus. Um, at first, I arrived there with me and Cameron, and we arrived with our own group of friends, and expected the same as normal any other festival it's like to have fun you go there to have fun see like artists that you'll never ever you can never possibly see again and as as soon as like as soon as we walk in like as soon as we pass the, the vaccination test like 
I could just tell, like, the way, pe how easily everyone was getting in, like, this was going to be, like, a crazy festival. And, like, security took less than, like, 30, it took me less than 30 seconds to walk in. I, I, I myself, I was wearing a belt. The, I didn't hear no, not one wand go off. Walked right through the security, the, the metal detectors, and didn't hear not a single one go off. Right by the security check-ins, there were cops. I remember I only seen only about five cops, and I've seen like 30 kids just run by, and they all just looked at them and just disregarded them, just talking about other stuff. And as we go through the security and make our way through, just like just like how they were saying how there was drug use and possible like all this other stuff. A girl even, I'm, we're walking over there to go to the stage, and I hear a girl behind me, oh, um, is all we're waiting on is the coke, right? And I'm just like, damn, like, what are y'all doing? Like, y'all are doing, like, y'all are really, like, doing that stuff here at a concert? Like, it's just nasty to think of that people have stuff there like that. And we get to the stage, and just like them, we were, we were on a different side from them, but I was by rail, and... All these performers are coming more and more. It, each more every time a performer, a new performer comes, more and more people just you feel your body just get compressed more and more. As the time goes on, you just you look behind you, you just see plenty of people behind you, more pushing up, pushing up, throwing random stuff, throwing random shoes, throwing beer cans, throwing all sorts of things you can think of. And it it was hectic. Like for once, like I've never felt like. I've never felt scared in my life, and for once, like, with all those people surrounding me, like, I was, I felt scared for myself, and just the amount of people there, like, just didn't feel right, like, it was too big for that festival, it was too big for everything, and after the last performer on the second stage goes, everybody's already, everyone's already exp waiting, waiting for Travis Scott to come on, so everyone's already pushing each other, running through everyone, running through security, telling everybody to relax, they're just pushing them, disregarding security, running to Travis Scott. We, we reached to the Travis Scott stage and immediately we're already in the very back and we're like, okay, well, let's try and go to the front. We're trying to make our way through the front. There's people like, what are y'all doing? Like, stop trying to push us in. And we're like, we're not trying to push no one in, you know? Like, we're just trying to go see, get, get a better view. And there's people fighting in, in there because Someone's taking one person's spot. Someone's stepping on someone's shoes. Someone's bumping into them a different, a wrong way because they're getting pushed around by so many people. There's waves of people going side to side, and all these people are like, "Bro, what are you pushing me for?" And you're like, "You can't say nothing." Like you're just like, "Well, I'm getting pushed too. Like, there's nothing you can do about it." And so we get to our spot. Travis Scott c performs. He does his first first like first 40 seconds in. Me and Cameron looked at each other. We're like, "This is not gonna go well." Like, I, like we already knew like something was gonna happen. And as so like as soon as the music just starts, like everyone's jumping, 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 and you just feel your body like rising with heat. Like you can barely breathe in there. And then I remember I look behind me and I see like a it literally looks like a whirlpool of just kids and people like falling and. People trying to reach up, like they're reaching up for you. Like people, you can, I literally heard people screaming, like "Help!" Like "Please help me!" And I was just like, I turned around and I was like, "Well, like, I like, I try. I wish I could help them. Like, I wish I could like do anything that I could do to help them, and I couldn't. And as like I turn around and I see them, and I'm just like, okay, I don't want to be near that. So we try, as we try to move away, the crowd is just the wave of people just pushes us, and. Cameron actually fell herself into the whirlpool and like that was the, I had my left arm around her the whole time and like for the whole concert the whole day I did not let go and that one second I let go like I just like knew like it was not going to be good and like, as soon as she falls I just hear her I just hear her screaming like I've never heard her scream like that and it's just like a traumatizing feeling because like someone you love just like screaming for help like for their lives and I reach out to help her and I just feel someone push me and then I land on someone and then they're screaming and I'm just hearing constant people screaming around me and I'm just like like I'm just trying to get out for myself and I get up and I finally like 
and I I notice when I get on this I land on the I landed on a girl. I notice her boyfriend's under, and he's like, like just get her up, like get her up. And I get up, and I remember seeing someone under him, literally face down on the ground, just under him, like res like res responseless, like he, like his face was just it's just ugly. It just wasn't, wasn't a good sight to see. And I go to pick Cameron up by her armpits, and she's screaming and screaming. And I pick her up, and like from the amount of people under her, her legs are stuck in between two. And I see people holding onto her legs, trying for me to pull them up with her. And it's just the ugliest thing, ugliest feeling, like knowing that people are trying to like hold onto her legs for their own lives, for me to pick them up. And then once I finally pick her up, we're like. We got to get out of here. Like we, we we can't fall back into this pit. If not, like things could get worse. And we try exiting, and no matter where we try to exit, we're screaming for help. Also, we we were right by the light boards. We were waving our hands at the light boards, waving them like help, like please stop, like to flash the lights at us at least to like show something. And nothing, zero response, nothing. As soon as the Song, a, a moment of silence, literally, every, you just hear people screaming, screaming, help, help. And then seconds later, you just hear Travis Scott just start another song. And it just, a nightmare, it's a whole nightmare that just continues to play every night in my head. Like, I wake up every night, in the middle of the night, thinking I'm on the ground again. Like, hearing her scream. This is... It, it, these are some of the young people that we are currently representing. We just wanted them to be introduced to you so you can at least hear some of these horrific stories of maybe their awful experience that they had to go through in this in, in this concert. At this point in time, they, they've been through a lot. They had a long day. They, they got here so they can let their stories out. We extend our condolences and our prayers to the families of those that actually lost their, their loved ones at, at this concert. As you can see from this, this was a, a horrific uh, experience uh, across the board. So uh, thank you all. And at this point in time, you got it. Um, who, who, uh, of the, who speaks Spanish? Who speaks Spanish? A lot of you? Ninguno quiere hablar español. Very little. No quiere hablar español tampoco. Estos, estos muchachos verdaderamente son de familias hispanas, todos vienen de Corpus y verdaderamente vinieron juntos aquí al concierto de Travis Scott y uno de los muchachos vino con su papá y verdaderamente el papá estaba ahí también en el concierto pero dejando a los niños, que los niños sean niños, pues los dejó entrar a la parte delante del concierto y verdaderamente en ese punto pues este papá que no está aquí, no pudo llegar a los niños en donde estaban. Y este señor, pues, en estos momentos eh, emocionalmente, pues, se siente peor que peor. Porque verdaderamente eh, no hay otro sentimiento que se pueda decir en la vida que ser un papá o una mamá y ver a un hijo o una hija y eh, en, en un lugar donde algo malo le va a pasar hasta perder la vida y uno no puede ir verdaderamente ayudarlo. So, eso es lo, lo que pasó en estos momentos con estos niños y verdaderamente pues viajaron aquí a, a hacer la introducción con ustedes y si me puede dar un minuto con ellos por favor porque han tenido un día pero bien largo. So, yeah, gracias and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Gracias. One question. Who's this gentleman back here? This gentleman works with me. He's an attorney. So he, his name is uh, Mr. Trinidad and uh, he... Perfect. Trinidad? Samora. Samora. Did you spell that for me? Sure. T-R-I-N-I-D-A-D. Okay. C-A-M-O-R-A. Just have one last question. Was Travis Scott supposed to be the last performer? Was he scheduled to be the final one? Yes. He was scheduled, yes, to be the final one, and he played He played the entire set. Uh, 37 minutes? He played the entire thing. So while no, many people were dead? Yes. While people were, were passing right in front of him, they'll tell you there were, there were kids that were being served out, basically passed out right in front of that stage as he was sitting up there with a bird's eye view looking down and he played the entire set. He never stopped it. 
knew fully well what was going on right in front of his eyes because people were telling him, even backstage, when it told him, hey, you have people that are passing out. This man may have been, may be dead. Fully aware, continues to play to the point where he says, you know what, raise your hand and give me the middle finger and let me know that basically we're okay and let's turn it up and let's do what you came here to do after seeing the bodies floating right in front of his face. So you know what, he took gasoline into the fire, he made a situation to the point where it just became a nightmare for every single one of these kids and he's as responsible as a culprit as anyone into what happened at that concert that night. How many feet were the bodies from him, um, would you say? I would probably say the bodies, the first one that I saw on the video, I would probably say about 50 feet, 100 feet, and probably from where he was because he was at a podium, he was at a pole standing with a bird's eye view looking down. So he's looking down at the crowd. At one point in time while he's on stage, he acknowledges the ambulance coming forward uh, into the crowd to go ahead and render aid to an individual that was down. And on stage, you can hear him say it. He's like, what the F is that? And then they tell him it's, it's an ambulance, looks at it, just continues, that was just one instance, continues to carry on and carry on and carry on. This is all ongoing right in front of him. This is not five people that fell down. This is hundreds of people that are falling down and passing out and being surfed out, basically uh, body surfed by the crowd, out, basically out of the pit, right in front of him. So he's fully aware of what was going on. But he finished his set, and the show must go on. Don't mean people got to keep dying once you see one go. How do you know somebody told him backstage, somebody passed out, you think that guy's going to die? There is a video out there. If, if, you, if you go through, go through social media, and I think they went back and they try to go ahead and delete it, okay? But if it was out there. It's, uh, it's on tape, and essentially we had somebody came down, which appeared to be a crew member, in a white shirt, and you could hear him say, hey, there's somebody back here. And uh, you need to go get him. It could be somebody's brother, somebody's sister. And what you see is, you see the entourage come in and just say, well, just, just roll them out. Just go ahead, just grab people and just, just roll them out. And he went right back in and kept right on going. And that was just one. The ambulance is two. Him up on the podium, you could see the actual female that was dropped on her head when they were trying to remove her, basically, okay, on a stretcher. That's three. I mean, you can count them because, uh, I mean, they're all on film. These kids, they video everything. So, I mean, everything is, is, is out there. I mean, you can't hide from it. I mean, the evidence is clean, you know. You saw uh, an unconscious woman dropped from a stretcher that was being carried yes. out? Yes. So we had a female that was dropped essentially from a stretcher. They got her on the stretcher to render aid after they, they waited 30 minutes to get to her. Once they get to her and they pick her up, they go ahead and then they, she fell right back on her face and on her head from the actual stretcher after she was picked up. And this is, this is all the things that they, they, they experienced at that, at, at that concert. I mean, this is just my interviewing them uh, over and over again so they can give me more details and they can tell me more. And of course, somewhat apprehensive at this time because of the emotional trauma that they went through. You know, they think every time they pick up the phone and they see it all over again, they have to relive it. So I told them we were going to do this one time and, and then after that, you know, they're going to go see their counselors and. Uh, you know, try to work on themselves and try to not get through this, but try to manage it as best they can. What, what, what words would you use to characterize the attitude of both the organizers and the performers? I don't give an F. If I had to go ahead and pick the phrase just like the one that he did when he wanted to go ahead and take that middle finger and put it up in the air, that's exactly what he did to every single one of those kids that was there. He didn't care. He didn't give an F. He didn't mind that there was going on. They had absolutely no control of the environment. They had no control over the crowd. They had no control over the criminal activity that was taking place. The security guard, according to Ashley, one of them told them they got hired the day before. Uh, they, they were just handing out jackets for security purposes. Uh, at one point in time, they didn't see any security guards at all. It, it was beyond a cavalier attitude. It was really just a a we just don't care. It's a profit-driven margin. That's, that's essentially all we see is profit margin because the staffing was not there. I don't know the proposal that they handed in in order to get the permit, but I want to look at the actual proposal that was handed in, 60 plus pages, and the actual plan that was actually there in play at the concert with the amount of personnel that was there.
So, so if you filed the lawsuit yet, are you planning on filing We're lawsuit? planning on filing the lawsuit because right now what we have is you have possible, you know, 13 defendants. You have maybe more. The, the issue is some of these defendants are, you know, ticket master or ticket holders. And these kids buy the tickets. So, you know, again, we, we keep telling these lawyers that are filing these lawsuits, you, you have an arbitration clause in some of these tickets that these kids bought. You're going to subject yourself to it if you go ahead and you sue the wrong defendant. That means as soon as you file your lawsuit, somebody's going to come in with a motion to abate. That just means a motion to stop the lawsuit because we have a clause, contractual clause, to go arbitrate any issues that come about from this concert by the purchase of this ticket. So all of a sudden, you're not going to trial anytime soon. You're going into the arbitration process, and you have not helped any one of those kids by undergoing this process and taking a shotgun approach and want to go ahead and sue the planet, and you end up suing the wrong person, and then you're going to get caught in a web, and you're not going to be able to get out. So it has to be handled with care for their benefit. This is about them and getting them justice and making sure they're taken care of throughout the process. So what's the basis of their lawsuit? Their, their basis of their lawsuit essentially is personal injuries. We don't have the assessment back on them, but primarily what they have, the injuries they sustain, and you're going to hear that from the kids that really were injured, is rib damage, rib cage damage, chest damage, the chest damage all the way down essentially to their, uh, all the way up where their rib cages are completely sore. They can't even breathe. So when they get up in the morning, these kids can't breathe, so we have to. They have to go ahead and take X-rays. They have to have the MRIs done. Now, have they sought that medical attention yet? We have to go ahead and put that in place for them. So they're they're going to go ahead. And they, that has been scheduled, and uh, yeah, that's. Do they have imagery of their physical scarring? Not yet, but as soon as as soon as soon as we get them, we'll we'll put them out there because this was just awful. So you've okay? not filed a lawsuit for your thirty clients yet. For the thirty clients, not yet, because because not every defendant will be treated the same way. Because we're not going to put these kids to a process that I want to be in a lawsuit to the end of Never Never Land uh, for uh, suing the wrong individual when I don't have to. So Yesterday, Tony Busby said he didn't think that the arbitration clauses would be applicable because of mining. Do you disagree with that? Well, you know what? Tony's not the judge. I don't know. Got to ask the judge. I mean, I'm going to tell you one thing. Every single Texas Supreme Court case in the last five years has upheld an arbitration clause. We are pro-arbitration in the state of Texas. That's just a fact. The Supreme Court over and over and over again has deferred to the arbitration clause in contracts and in other forms as a way to go ahead and resolve a dispute as a contractual obligation, meaning you reach a contract that that's the way that you are going to settle your dispute. Now, whether or not uh, a court is going to uphold it or not, you know, I, I can't tell you that. What I'm going to tell you is that Tony may say that, but it's going to be about 50 cases from the Supreme Court of Texas on the other side of that argument. And that's just a fact. So who are you definitely going to sue, and would Cameron like to say something? As of this point in time, that decision will be made tomorrow morning. We're going to have a meeting late tonight, and uh, that lawsuit will be on file. But right now we're probably looking at four of the more, how can I say this, the more convenient defendants that will probably not be on the list, primarily because of that reason. Can I you can clarify your talking about when Cameron fell, like, at what point during Travis Scott that like that happened? Was it far into it or right at the beginning or I don't even remember? It was like two to three minutes when within, within his first song. Like it felt like everything happened like within four to five minutes of him starting. But like it felt like forever, honestly. And then how long did it take you to, to maybe actually be able to get her up or get her get her to safety or get her in it, a safer position? It took me like a good minute or two to fully get her out with having to deal with people pushing me, me nearly falling as I'm picking her up, having having other people trying to like come up with her. I was it took me a minute. Is it like a layer of like bodies? You could it was it was a layer. You could see people below, like two other people. I, like like I said, whenever I landed on uh, that girl and her boyfriend, I seen someone under the boyfriend, just face down, under them. And, and, and there's plenty of other videos out there that show layers of just people and crowds. So this is this is just the, the, the beginning of the story. And, and again, if they could just be excused, please. They had a very long day. And I want to go ahead and talk to them in the back. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it.